Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Ed Boyden from MIT and a HHMI investigator, and we discuss his very early work in the lab. So I started college really young. I was 14 years old, and I worked in a laboratory that was trying to create life in a test tube which of course didn't happen or you would have heard about it. And how he manages one of the largest neuroscience groups in the world. Right now we have uh, 56 full-time researchers in the group, split half and half between graduate students and um, postdocs or staff scientists. Might seem hard to believe, but despite his current successes, Ed admits he struggled to get his first permanent role in academia. It was hard uh, getting a faculty job actually, so, uh, I wanted to start the first group that just did technology for reading and writing to the, you know, to the brain. And um, yeah, a lot of places uh, didn't like that. So um, I was rejected by the majority of the places I applied to. And how he's now using expansion microscopy to explore new exciting ground in neuroscience. You know, we have a technique that we call expansion microscopy, where, you know, for literally 300 years, people have been zooming in with a lens. We started thinking, why don't we just take the darn thing and make it bigger? all in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole and welcome to The Microscopists. Uh, Today I'm joined by Ed Boyd from MIT at Stanford University. Ed, how are you today? Doing all right, doing all right. Good to see you. Yeah, likewise. Ed, I, I, I looked at your background and I was trying to figure out how you got to where you are today, because because it's what well, I don't think you were heading into where you are today. So if we, if we go right back when you were a child, what did you want to be? Well, when I was a child, I was um, I was very philosophical. I really wanted to understand the meaning of life. And uh, I went through a very religious phase, for example, when I was about eight years old or so. And. And around age nine, I really got obsessed with this idea that, you know, science might help us understand what it means to be human and maybe to alleviate suffering of the human condition. So um, two things happened. I became very ambitious and wanted to, to learn everything. And, um, and then secondly, I decided to work on uh, towards uh, scientific projects that connect to philosophy. So I started college really young. I was 14 years old and I worked in a laboratory that was trying to create life in a test tube which of course didn't happen or you would have heard about it. Um, And then I transferred to a different school and switched majors and uh, ended up um, uh, working on quantum computing, another project that sort of blends the mysterious and the scientific. Um, uh, And that also was really hard, right? You know, it's been decades since and we still don't have very good quantum computers. Um, And third time's a charm in 1998 or so, I decided to work on the brain. And it turned out that you know the chemistry and physics that I learned from those early projects had prepared me to take a, a different tack on the brain. So um, yeah, that was what sort of the pivot into neuroscience. So to what degrees did you do? As an undergraduate? Yeah, undergraduate. I was an undergraduate for six years. So I studied chemistry for two years at the University of North Texas. They have a program where high school students can skip the last two years of high school and go right to college it's called TAMS. Texas Academy of Math and Science. Um, And then I transferred to MIT and spent four years there where I majored in electrical engineering, computer science, and physics. So I ended up kind of knowing a pretty broad swath of science and um, and importantly, fundamental sciences, things that stand the test of time and that really can be applied in any direction you want. So, um, and then I, for my PhD, went on to uh, to neuroscience at Stanford. I said, that, that which, which is obviously a bio, bio biological side of it. So you've done your chemistry, you've done your physics, you've done your maths, you've done your compute science, and then you ended up going to a PhD. In a, or, I know it's related, but a different subject again. How did you find that leap from chemistry, physics, maths, where things are maybe you do A, B, and you get C, to life sciences, where you do A twice over and you get a different answer? Well. 
that's part of why I really enjoyed the path that I took, where I learned the fundamental sciences as an undergraduate. And then I started working on the more emergent sciences, where there's still a lot of art as well as science in it uh, for my PhD. And that was a great uh, sort of, you know, one, two transition where I had a lot of skills and now I could apply those skills to problems that, that uh, you know, are widely regarded as uh, un unsolvable currently. You know, trying to understand how the brain generates the mind, what happens during thinking, what is a feeling, you know, can we cure Alzheimer's disease? The list goes on and on. How did you find a supervisor to take you on, being as you hadn't got the biology background to do a neuroscience PhD? My co-advisors, Jennifer Raymond and Dick Chen at Stanford, um, had made similar transitions, actually. Jennifer had studied mathematics before entering neuroscience, and Dick had also uh, studied electrical engineering before switching into, into biology. So it was great to, to have mentors who understood that transition and and uh, it was a fantastic uh, environment um, in their two groups at Stanford where I did my, my graduate work on motor learning. So we tried to study how motor memories are encoded in the brain using a variety of molecular and behavioral uh, approaches. I, I, I think Dan Davis, who I did a podcast with some time ago, did exactly the same. He, he went from physics undergraduate and then went over to the States and did a PhD in immunology. Uh, but I, I think it's amazing, actually, that you find supervisors that are, that are willing to do that. And I think, yeah, look at your career. Look at Dan's career. They're amazingly successful careers. And I think, yeah, I, I think should, maybe it's a good lesson that people should be open to who they're recruiting as their PhDs. If I recall properly, I could be wrong, but there were five undergraduates who graduated my year at MIT. This is 1999, who became MIT faculty. And if I recall, all five of us trained in physics, electrical engineering, or math, or something like that, and all five of us ended up working on biology. So there's a there's a big, I think, transition now uh, where the life sciences are, you know, full of unknowns, desperately in need of technology, um, and uh, so these more mature sciences, um, you know, people are are leaving them and trying to go to the the, the unknown. So. I, I, it is a stellar career, as you say. You know, after year two, as your undergraduate, you then went to MIT. And I don't think you've left MIT. I, th I think you've been there most of the time, haven't you, since? All the way oh, through? Yeah. So after I finished my PhD at Stanford in 2005, I uh, postdoc for several months, but then um, joined MIT in the fall of 2006. And uh, yeah, I've been running my group here ever since, 16 years. And, and I've got to ask, because you, you look insanely young and you've been there since 2006, which must mean you were exceptionally young when you started out on that career path? Yeah, well, starting college when I was uh, 14, I always thought, hey, I've got a couple extra years. I can use those years to take risks and try bold, ambitious things, but then I kept getting lucky. And so, yeah, uh, it, the luck continued. I kind of think of the core discipline that I'm trying to, to apply here is sort of luck engineering, right? You know, biology requires lots of luck. You know, people discovered CRISPR, the people who discovered penicillin. A lot of biology is luck. But then how can we be lucky on purpose? And that's kind of what I like to do and what I like to train our group members on. Yeah, and, you, and you have to be looking for the lucky answer, maybe. So, so it's not complete luck. You've, you've had to create some of that luck, I, I would say. So, so don't, don't do yourself down. Oh, no, no. Luck is learnable and teachable. In fact, when I got tenure, my group made post-it notes with all the things that I say all the time. And so they, these are some of the post-it notes that they commissioned. And so it has things like, you know, let's go for the ground truth, right? Um, you know, you have to think backwards from the goal, um, you know, don't make assumptions and so forth. And these, these are all skills that can be applied to be lucky. And, and we, I actually have published two papers on, on other skills that can be applied. So for example, one thought is, you know, if everybody's doing one thing, do the opposite of it, right? You know, we have a technique that we call expansion microscopy, where, you know, for literally 300 years, people have been zooming in with a lens. We started thinking, why don't we just take the darn thing and make it bigger? And so there are, there are I, th I, get, I think luck is a learnable, teachable thing. And, and so, so I, I obviously know your work around expansion microscopy fairly well, uh, and we're just dying to dabble in it at the moment ourselves. How on earth can you take something so small? I, how, how big have you expanded things now? What's the limit you've reached? I don't think there really is a limit. I mean, you can take something and expand it. Uh, so for those who don't know expansion microscopy is, we take a specimen, we infuse it with baby diaper polymer, add water, and we can make the specimen much bigger. And because it's a precise expansion, it lets you use ordinary microscopes to do nano imaging. So 
hundreds and hundreds of studies have already come doing expansion. It's spreading very, very quickly. But back to the original question, you can take a specimen, put the baby diaper polymer in and expand it, make a second round of baby diaper infusion and expand it again. And you can do it over and over and over again. We've done up to one million fold volumetric expansion. I, I'm just trying to get my head around the scale that that would actually be at that point. Yeah. Think, there can't be anything left of a cell to see at that point. It's gonna be so diffuse. That... Well, we do fluorescence microscopy. So we always add fluorescent tags anyway to decorate the things we want to see. Um, so actually expanding it and making it diffuse is awesome because now it's completely transparent. And we had a joint paper with Eric Betzik, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on nanoimaging, where we expanded and then did this um, light sheet imaging strategy that uh, they developed called lattice light sheet imaging. And you know, in light sheet, you illuminate a two-dimensional section, and take a picture at a 90 degree, 90 degree angle, so you can go blazing fast speeds. And we estimated in that paper, which is um, in, in the journal Science in early 2019, that we could uh, go about a thousand times faster than the nearest competing nanoimaging method. So that's for the, the lattice light sheet. And I, as you say, when you get something so big, you then need to, to, to image faster because you're imaging a much bigger area or using a low magnification lens, I guess, as a compromise. Um, well, so the, ordinary micro, the vast majority of people are still using ordinary microscopes to do the imaging. I mean, um, the, you know, uh, of the hundreds of papers that have been coming out so far, I think mostly just use a regular confocal microscope. You might not need a huge volume to be imaged to get a lot of insight into a biological process. You know, people are looking at the set of skeleton, people are looking at the nucleus, people are looking at motor proteins, people look at synapses. Sometimes a little bit of nanoimaging will tell you something fundamental. Um, and you might not need to image an entire tumor or an entire brain with nanoscale precision to get a huge insight into a biological process. I don't want to go too geeky at this point, but, I, but I've got to ask the question because one of the things you often hear is how does it stay in proportion? X, Y, Z. How does it how does it not distort those dimensions? So you've got a precise measurement of the cell. Yeah. Well, the polymer is very dense, right? The spacing between polymer threads is only one to two nanometers, smaller than most biomolecules, right? Or many biomolecules anyway. Um, we also anchor the biomolecules to the polymer. So as the polymer expands, the biomolecules are dragged apart. And then finally, uh, we soften the specimen using enzymes or detergent or heat. So that when the pulling apart happens, it's a smooth process. So by design, it's an isotropic process. But we've also validated it very extensively. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm well aware. It's just, you know, you mention it and people go, oh no, it must, you know, distort in some dimension and everything else. So I thought it was good to get it directly from you that it is, as it does expand completely proportionally. Yeah, the distortion is not zero, but it's really, really small. It's like a few percent over a typical microscope field of view. And it turns out for the vast, vast majority of biological and medical problems, that's totally okay. Yeah, and maybe we shouldn't ignore the fact that when we do super resolution techniques, there's, 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 there's aberrations in the image that also distort when you get down to that type of resolution. So, you know, I, nothing is perfect, that's for sure. Yeah. So you got into expansion microscopy, but I, I think you first made your name, or you, you, your career really around optogenetics. Mm. Uh, yeah, that was a side project that was done in parallel to my PhD. So I met a fellow student, Carl Weisroth, when I was just starting out at Stanford. He was in the same lab. Uh, we started brainstorming about how we could control the brain with light. And so it was sort of a parallel collaboration, not in my thesis at all for my PhD, but uh, in fact, we published the first light-controlled neurons before I turned in my PhD on motor learning. Um, and uh, yeah, it started to take off very fast. So again, I guess that would be what you call one of your lucks, as it were. But again, right place, right time, and right solution to it. Yeah. Well, there are lots of examples of, of, of again, luck generating skills, right? So one thing that is very useful is to look at something that people can do but it might not be so easy to use by everybody. Um, and then can you make something that is deployable and that works for everybody, right? You know, CRISPR was not the first genome editing method, right? Google was not the first search engine. But if you look for something that somebody's doing and you can make it work in everybody's hands, that could be great. And so many people had developed ways of controlling neurons of life before optogenetics, 
but they all were either complicated or had, you know, they required ultraviolet light, which biologists don't like, or they would require chemicals to be administered, which biologists don't like. And, and so if we just had a visible light driven, all off the shelf, you know, protein that didn't require chemical supplementation, then that would be great. And that's what optogenetics is. We take these genes, put them into neurons, shine light, the gene product converts the light to electricity. I, I've got to ask, you mentioned Google wasn't the first search engine. What was the first search engine you used? Can you remember? Oh, there was AltaVista and yeah. like, and um, I can't remember all the other ones, but, but I do remember like running searches in multiple engines to try to find out which, kind of having them vote. <laughs> so. yeah, no, I certainly remember AltaVista yeah. as, as, as the one that was the default that we go to. And then, then Google came along and I don't know, you kind of felt loyal to Alta Vista for a while. And then, and then you kind of thought, oh, no, Google is better and switch. <laughs> strange emotions to something you've got very little control over. How yeah. big is your lab at the moment? How many PhDs and postdocs do you have? Oh. Right now we have uh, 56 full-time researchers in the group, split 50. half and half between 50. graduate students and um, postdocs or staff scientists. And yeah, it's it's, Maybe, I don't know, is it the biggest neuroscience group on earth? I'm not sure, but it's it's very large. But importantly, a lot of the people in our group are co-advised. They work between my group and another group. And that's how we've been helping people discover new potential treatments for Alzheimer's disease, new ways of understanding schizophrenia, you know, new um, methods of, of um, you know, uh, all, all sorts of stuff. ways of seeing things in new ways, ways of controlling things in new ways. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of this co-advising strategy. How do you manage, how do you cope with the diversity of those projects that are going on in your environment? Yeah, I try to run the group on a three week clock. So I meet with everybody for half an hour during that period. So if you have 10 hours a day times five days a week, that's 50 half hour slots, right? Um, and uh, 50 hour slots, excuse me, 100 half hour slots, is that right? Wow, that's a lot of meeting slots. So uh, yeah, so if you, if you manage your time well, uh, uh, it's possible to to get one on one meetings with everybody and 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 uh, lots of time to think and work and write and plan. So. And your your energy levels are obviously they look endless. How do you keep your energy levels and your enthusiasm so high? Because you must be enthusing your students. You know they they they're going to be motivated. They're going to be motivated by you. How do you actually keep those energy levels so high? Hmm, good question. Well, I think it's important to sleep a lot. Um, I drink lots of coffee, um, and uh, but I think for me, it's maybe the core is just that I am motivated. You know, it goes back to this long-standing obsession. You know, I really think that maybe we could help understand what it means to be human and to help people who have oh, it's what over a billion people around the world have some kind of of brain condition, and as the population of the world ages, it's getting more and more. So, yeah, and so, so you you do the ten hours a day. Fine. You said you sleep a lot. What do you do between work and sleep? Um, well, I have a family. Uh, uh, let's see, two children, ages nine and twelve. Um, yeah, my wife is a professor at BU. She runs Boston University Neurotechnology Group. We used to collaborate on many projects. Still have a few collaborations ongoing. Um, I like to travel. Um, I've probably given at this point over five hundred lectures over the years, and I love meeting interesting people and going new places. And um, yeah, so I just uh, spent a couple days in Houston at the Rice Neuroengineering Conference and at UT. And before that, I was in Denmark, uh, Aarhus University at their uh, annual conference. And yeah, again, as a believer in luck, you know, connecting the dots between ideas and fields is a way of being more deliberately lucky. And uh, sorry, your nine and 12 year old, is that correct? Boy, girl, boy, boy, girl, girl. 12 year old boy and nine year old girl. Yeah. Okay. And are they showing signs of following the same footsteps steps of yourself and your wife? Um, well, it all rapidly changes. Um, you know, uh, they're, they're both interested in many things, you know, art and science and, you know, um, uh, business um, and writing and, and all sorts of things. So, yeah. That's cool. And uh, I, I've got to say, are they into anything? What, what, are, they, what are their hobbies? Are they into their soccer their hockey their yeah um let's see yeah i mean they both like different arts uh like um 
uh, you know, painting and drawing and, and writing and, and that kind of thing. They both like math. They both take math after school um, uh, uh, classes. Um, um, yeah, we try to do more outdoors things, uh, you know, uh, hiking and exploring and so forth. That's cool. I've got some uh, quick fire questions for you. I, oh, I think you probably answered some of these already, but we're going to go anyway. Sure. PC or Mac? I just switched to Mac. Yeah, I had a PC, but um, it died, and then uh, um, all they were backordered. The ones that I, I wanted with a lot, a lot of storage, so I bought a Mac as the only uh, thing that's around that uh, had enough solid state disk. So I've been learning, unlearning thirty one years of keyboard shortcuts lately. How are you coping with that? Uh, it's slow. It's slow. Yeah. Okay. So McDonald's or Burger King? Um, let's see. I guess recently we've been uh, getting burgers from Shake Shack. So uh, yeah, every Tuesday, that's going to become our new family tradition. <laughs> it sounds fun. Uh, I, 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 I think I know this straight off. Tea or coffee? Um, yeah, I drink coffee every hour and a half um, before four o'clock, and then at four o'clock I'll switch to tea. Okay. And are they espressos, americanos, milky coffees? Um, I have an espresso machine over there, and I try. Yeah, I take two shots about every ninety minutes or so, starting from when I wake up. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of coffee in a day. I, 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 yeah. I guess yeah, you become immune to part of it and just feed off it. Yeah, and I like the ritual of it too, you know, making the coffee and smelling it. And yeah, it's just, uh, it's very meditative. So do you grind your own coffee in the office or is it pods? Um, we used to have our own uh, machine that would grind things and, and so forth, but it's hard to clean. So recently we switched to, to pods once we got convinced that the pods were recyclable. So Okay. And at home? At home, uh, we have a lot of different coffee machines, uh, two espresso machines. Yep. One in my office upstairs and one in the kitchen. Um, a, a, a coffee machine and then a drip coffee machine. So I guess you had four and a French press if that counts. So five then. Okay. That, 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 I, I also have two espresso machines at home and two at work. Oh, fine. Yeah. One pod, one that I grind and cook. Okay. Can't beat it fresh. Proper I know. fresh. I know. Espresso, you do. It's just, yeah. just, yeah, no, absolutely is the best. Wine or beer? What's that? Wine or beer? Oh, definitely wine. Yeah, yeah. Red or white? Uh, red. Yeah, I like deep reds. That. Um, yeah, I don't know why, but um, I've always been just drawn to that. Any favorite grape? Grape? Oh, like Cabernets, I guess. I've had to pick one, but uh, you know, blends are great too. I'm not that into the technical details, I guess. So, um, but uh, but uh, yeah, it's like dry red wines i guess okay so after your after your coffee you hit the deep red wines chocolate or cheese to accompany it uh i don't eat much sugar anymore so if they if we get like the extremely dark chocolate that's coarsely ground um i like that stuff but yeah definitely cheese would be my default okay that's cool so going go back onto the more serious stuff and on to work have you had any really difficult or challenging times at work it was hard uh, getting a faculty job, actually. So um, uh, I wanted to start the first group that just did technology for reading and writing to the, you know, to the brain. And um, yeah, a lot of places uh, didn't like that. So um, I was rejected by the majority of the places I applied to. And I started out as a professor in MIT School of Architecture, of all things. Um, if I recall properly, they had a faculty search on a different topic and were about to close it. Uh, I, I, if I recall, they didn't hire anybody. And then uh, I had been a teaching assistant for one of the faculty, I guess, on the committee. And they said, oh, well, why don't you apply to this? So I, I applied there. And that's where I was until two years ago when my group fully moved into the neuroscience building. And now I'm a professor in, in brain and cognitive sciences as my home department as of, of about two years ago. So, I, I, so we sound remarkable because obviously your career has been stellar. It was stellar from the, from the offset before you even got there. But you, because of what you wanted to study, you couldn't find an academic you know, sort of leading post. <clears throat> we have to remember brain technology was not cool back then. You know, uh, the number of brain technologies that had been developed was, uh, was a handful, right? You know, two photon microscopy, functional MRI, patch clamp. You know, there are a handful of, of ones that were regarded as 
was really pioneering, but that was you know, over a two decade period. So um, yeah, I really wanted to start a group that just focused on that all day long. And, um, and so, yeah, people were quite skeptical of it back then. And when you started your group, how did you find it going for sort of being someone who was, I doubt you were ever properly supervised. I think you were probably very self-motivated anyway, but how did you find it having that responsibility of having your own students and postdocs working for you? Oh, it's great. Yeah. I mean, having trained in physics and electrical engineering, I think I've always been a bit more of a theoretically minded person. And I was able to do really great experiments, but I, I love thinking. I love analyzing data and, and that kind of thing. So I, it was wonderful. Um, you know, it's not like you get training on it. So it did take a couple of years for me to, to learn, um, you know, uh, sometimes just by experimenting a bit, you know, how to run a scientific group. And that tradition continues, continues to this day where many of my students now for their last chapter of their PhD will write a whole chapter about how they would change science if they were in charge. And, and many of them started their own institutions. Uh, one of them right out of graduate school. Um, many of them started companies. Many have gone to faculty jobs. You know, some of them right out of graduate school. And it's become a real tradition to think about how people would reform science. It's, it's just incredible. <laughs> so I, I'm going to ask a question now. Do you prefer the biological question, the technology development, or the back end analysis of what's coming out from all that? In terms of my own day to day work or what I appreciate yeah. reading? Do it yourself. Well, what, 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 where's your passion? Where, where would you, if you think all your time, if you had to think all your time into one of those foci, whether it be the biology that's coming through, the technology development to look at the biology or the analysis that's coming out, what would you choose? Well, I guess that's not how I think. What I, I, I want to see biology become a mature science, right? And so um, our group is morphing, right? We used to be pure tools, but now we're about one third application, two thirds tools, and that's gonna to continue to evolve. I'm gonna probably spend this fall um, learning some computer science to get more into machine learning and analysis of the data too. Um, my dream is for biology to be a mature science, you know, physics after quantum mechanics. And now you can make lasers and microchips on the internet and land on the moon and so forth, right? Um, chemistry after the periodic table, and then you can make Teflon and nylon and who knows what else, right? My, my dream is that biology undergoes a similar transition where we can, we can see everything and control everything. And that leads to a mature science where you can design the solution to a problem. And um, yeah, so I, I think for up till now, it's, it's been driven by tools, right? We wanna see everything and control everything in the brain and in the body. But now the tools are getting so good that we are applying them more and more. You know, projects that our group uh, initiated or helped others initiate are now have now, have now led to treatments in clinical trials for blindness, for for Alzheimer's. Um, you know, uh, startup companies and so forth. You know, showing uh, potential human benefit and 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 now you know now we're like, hey, you know, the, the world's changing. We're gonna change as well, right? So we thought about the difficult times, the challenges you've had. What about the most fun time? Well, why, if, if you could think about any time in your career to date, what has been the most, the, the, the best time, the most enjoyable time of that career so far? It's so much fun to see something for the first time, you know? When we mm -hmm. first, did, when it, I did the first light activated neuron uh, at one o'clock in the morning and it, it just worked, you know? Uh, um, and, uh, you know, with all the work that we've done in expansion, it was so beautiful to see the first expanded brain you know that was kind of a shock and just delightful yeah i think it's just one of the, the reasons why science is so much fun is you do get to see you know something for the first time in history quite often if you if you you know pick problems strategically and you then you know use these learnable teachable skills to to drive creative problem solving so you've got a team of over 50 people and i'm just thinking here you've got so many techniques at your disposal do you have a favorite technique so again, that's not really how I think about it, just because, you know, I always want to start with the question, right? And I think there's really two big questions right now. How do we see everything and how do we control everything, right? In the brain and in the body. Now, the current means to do that is to build tools, right? So seeing includes expansion microscopy, spatial multiplexing, and so forth. Control includes optogenetics and, and all sorts of methods for perturbing systems. Um, and then, of course, we apply that when, you know, if there's an opportunity, we have a collaboration uh, led by Liwei Sai at MIT to try to, you know, tackle Alzheimer's disease, right? One of the most intractable diseases of our time. You know, no disease-modifying treatments, much less cures. Um, 
my own grandmother has, has Alzheimer's disease. You know, if we can make a dent in that, let's do it. So I guess I think it more is just, you know, here, the end goal is we want biology to be a mature science so that like physics or chemistry before it, people can just get stuff done, right? Solve the problem. And, and that requires us to, to, to work on these multiple levels to technology, application, analysis, and theory. And what about favorite publication that you've authored or co-authored? Do you have a, a favorite one for whatever reason? So again, I guess it, they're all puzzle pieces of a, of a larger whole, right? You know, if you see something, you know, uh, so expansion microscopy lets you do nano imaging for cheap, but it doesn't work on a living thing, right? More recently, we published a paper on spatially multiplex live imaging, where you take a cell and image different signals from different places in the cell. That gives you high speed live imaging of many things at once, but its spatial precision is not as good. So I find it hard to pick just one thing. I see it more as like a, an overarching landscape of possibility, right? So you think about physics and chemistry, right? I like to study the history of science because I think you can learn a lot about the future. You know, in physics, you have quantum mechanics, right? Where you have wave functions and, and, and matrix uh, algebra and so forth. And then you also have those certain things that you can do like make semiconductors and so forth, which led to the microchip. So in chemistry, you have the periodic table, but you also have the theory of the molecular bond, you have thermodynamics and you have certain reactions, right? You kind of need all of them. So the way I think about it is if we want to de-risk biology, make it a very mature science, we have to see control, right? See and control things. And those tools have to be integrated in a way that yields actionable you know, insights that are therapeutic and theories that de-risk the future of science. That's how I think about it, you know, by analogy to the structure of the scientific fields of chemistry and physics. So I, I'm, I, again, a quick, a quick Google will tell me quite a lot, but you have won so many awards and, and it's not surprising. It really isn't. So you, I think uh, Discover Magazine top 20 scientists under 40 and you're probably only about 20 at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you got the <laughs> one of the MIT technical uh, TR35 so top innovator uh, under 35. Uh, National Academy of Sciences 2019. I, I, I only picked three because otherwise I could. the podcast doesn't last that long to list them all. Uh, how do you find the awards? Are, are you, does that give you a sense of achievement, reward? Are you not plussed by it? What's your, what's your emotions towards the awards? There's so many of them. Um, good question. Well, I think rewards have two practical outcomes. One is that it does sort of legitimize the work and, and make it more classical, you know? Going, you know, going from the rebellious phase to, wow, this is part of science. It, I think the awards are part of that. And other things too, like, you know, when Obama, then President, US President Obama announced the Brain Initiative in 2013, I went to the White House for the announcement and um, several of the people on the committee there were like, oh yeah, Ed, we want more groups like yours. This is the, one of the goals of the Brain Initiative would be to, to you know, help more people like you um, get into brain science from engineering and so forth. And so it was very gratifying to hear that as well. Uh, the other practical outcome, of course, is that, um, you know, um, it can, you know, raise the profile of the field. You know, if, if people from different fields, we can bring them into neuroscience, that helps a lot, right? Yep. And, um, and some of the, the awards, like the Breakthrough Prize, um, uh, which is a, a $3 million prize, I think it's the largest, neuros not largest neuroscience prize, the largest science prize on earth. Um, you know, it gets, it's got so much attention from people that people would be like, hey, uh, you know, this, the, the, I hadn't heard of this thing before. I, I'm an expert in this field. Uh, how can I help, you know? And so that's also been really exciting to see all the talent pouring into this area where we just need so much help. Uh, so, so, I, and that's, yeah, I, I can't find the right word, but you know, all that, diff all that, that you just said is not about you, is it? It's all What's about, it's, it's not about you. You know, you just said the awards that you have won, but you see them as just a great way of actually inspiring others and getting other people to be aware of the importance of the research that you're undertaking, which I, I think is a really honorable approach to this and, and really well-deserved. Uh, well, it's all about being driven by the ultimate goal for me. And that, that for me is the understanding of human existence and, you know, uh, and then remedying it and making it better. And so, yeah, I, I, even, I guess I even see the awards as a kind of technology that drives the greater goal, I guess. So moving back into some quick fire questions, are you an early bird or night owl? Definitely early. Yeah, I'm usually in bed by nine and up by, by five or six. Okay. See, they're, they're pretty sensible hours, I, I would say. You know, early bird, definitely. But, you know, you'll get, as you say, you're getting a good sleep. 
Absolutely. It's so important. Sleep drives creativity. I'm pretty convinced. Oh, I've got to ask a question now. When your head hits the pillow, do you do you go asleep, switch off really fast? Yeah, I usually meditate for a few minutes with that young. Yeah, which, which is healthy and good. Absolutely. Book or TV? Um, it depends, yeah, uh, kind of on the circumstance. Um, I like books, but I write so much that I often am tired by the time I can read them. But uh, yeah, I've been reading books that are about meditation and mindfulness recently, and it's been very interesting. And TV, you said both? Um, if there's something really good, then I'll watch it. Um, I, I, I don't watch that much. I've maybe only completed one or two whole series in my, my life. But, but, um, but yeah, if there's something good. And what about a favorite film, favorite movie? Hmm. Good question. I find it hard to pick because um, some movies I, I watch because I think they um, can serve some kind of role or function, like they motivate me or, um, and then others are just fun and, and so forth. Yeah, I, I, I'd have to think about that, I guess. <laughs> none, none of mine is a clear, sorry, go ahead. As we go on, you might one might pop into your head and go, no, actually, I'll, I'll settle on that one. What about a favorite the original, the original, The original Matrix I found very inspiring. Okay. Uh, yeah. Actually, that was around the time that I was thinking about optogenetics and this whole idea of brain control. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think that did influence me some, that movie. Um, of course, we want to uh, use optogenetics to ease suffering. And The Matrix, of course, is very dystopian. But, but I remember watching the movie and thinking, hmm, this is a... You know, uh, this is an example of, you know, neurotechnology gone wrong, you know, but what could, could we make one that would be beneficial to people? It's amazing, isn't it? The things that just in life, little things that you don't think about necessarily, but actually are a trigger or an inspiration to take to that next step. Have you had many inspirations in your career? Many what? Inspirations, uh, any mentors or people you've looked up to and thought, oh, yes. And that's kind of inspired you to take a career step or change or development. I try to take inspiration from everyone and everything and to learn from every interaction. Yeah. But I think um, reading two biographies, um, one of Seymour Benzer and one of Max Delbruck, right as I was pivoting from physics into biology, was very helpful because these are examples of people who also made that transition. Um, and Max Delbruck, you know, basically helped found molecular biology. Sierra Benzer discovered genes that modulate behavior. Um, it, it was it was just very helpful to learn how to think through the transition. I, I, I think that's really good advice uh, and looking for those inspirations. I, I apologize, you probably won't get much inspiration off me personally today, but, but certainly it's working the other way around. Um, do you have a favorite Christmas movie? Christmas movie? Uh, does Die Hard count? Oh, absolutely it counts. Of course it counts. Yeah. It can or cannot. Oh, it, it definitely can, can't it? Surely. Yeah, I'm trying to think of any other Christmas movies that I know of. But um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, Die Hard, I like. Uh, it just also just, is it, I just, it, it's actually influenced a little bit how I try to tell scientific stories because it's a, it will set up a plot and then it answers the plot question with an answer later. And it, uh, and many people talked about how just tightly scripted it is, and and um, and uh, but yeah, I think I, I think uh, if I had to pick like an unusual inspiration, um, I, I definitely think reading the script for Die Hard shaped how I think about scientific storytelling. Okay, I, I, yeah, I love the movie. It is one of the best movies, I think. Uh, what about music? What's your uh, favorite genre of music? I mostly like to listen to classical music, but I've listened for it so long that I've, I've recently been listening more to like electronic music. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. I listened to some Chopin and, and Beethoven, and I was just listening to some Brahms piano pieces last week, but also really, not reading, listening to a lot of electronic music from like different you know, French and, and German uh, producers and so forth recently as well. Okay, have your children got that same passion or are they getting you into more pop dance rock music um they listen to a lot of the stuff that i listen to because you know we, we and they, they both play music they play uh, stringed instruments and piano as well and um so we'll yeah we have a lot of music in the family do you play any musical instruments not well i'd like to mess around on the piano okay 
Yeah, I, I fear that you say not well, but it's probably absolutely brilliant just on your own <laughs> standards, not well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, is it genuinely not well? About as bad as my piano? I've got a piano just behind me. But trust me, I, it's, I, I get on it so infrequently. I have, do you know what people say? It's like a bike you never forget. Well, I, I, I'm scared to go on a bike because I've really forgotten how to play it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But yourself, so, uh, and just to, just the piano that you learned. I learned French horn, but uh, I haven't touched that in many, 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 many years. Oh, that reminds me, Petra Schwiller. She, 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 she's always a one, a one person band, the number of instruments that she plays with her family. So he's quite wow. something. Uh, Very so, cool. Sorry? Very cool. Yeah, no, yeah, it is. Do you have any other hobbies? I like the outdoors. I love hiking and exploring and um, yeah, I love nature. As a kid, uh, I, my dad and I would go camping every month uh, for a while. And it was always, yeah, I love exploring uh, waterfalls and forests and deserts and all sorts of stuff. Oh, oh that, that, that is a good question. So you, you travel a lot. Do you prefer to go to a hot location? temperate or cold location do you actually have a preference if you could choose one holiday would it be somewhere hot somewhere moderate or somewhere that's actually icy snowy cold i try to mix it up yeah for the last several years um our families tried to go spend the week between christmas and new year's on a beach somewhere but i also like skiing and being in cold places too oh, so if you so here, if you go to a beach, you actually unwind and actually stop thinking, or are you uh, always after going sightseeing, going to see something different, or do you actually chill out and relax? Um, a bit of both. Yeah, I really tried to relax. Um, usually by day three or four, though, of the week, then I start wanting to read and write again. So <laughs> it sounds like your 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 wife has similar passions. So. I, yeah, I do, we the brain technology group at BU and uh, yeah, works on all sorts of wonderful brain interfacing, stimulation and recording and imaging methods and applies them to different diseases. Uh, so you obviously do teaching as well as the research. Uh, do, do you have the same passion for teaching as you do for your research? Well, I, I teach classes that I designed or co-designed. So yes, um, I, teach, I teach classes which are very much about creativity and problem solving. We actually try to simulate what, how I teach people in my group to solve problems, but compressed to a class. And um, the students do projects where they have to invent new tools and, um, or at least in, in, a, in a class format do that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a microcosm of the group that's been rendered in classroom form. So it's a lot of fun. Actually, it does sound really cool. <laughs> and you yeah. know, I can't think of many places that would enable that to be taught. <clears throat> I, I, I'm trying to think. It, it, it's not an easy subject to be teaching that type of <coughs> skill. I think it's a really important skill. Uh, Our so alumni I are applying this way of thinking all over the map now. You know, one of my graduate students, Sarah Skarsik, quit the PhD, and then in, uh, in a matter of months, really, raised over a hundred million US dollars to go and, and fight climate change. And then several of my alumni uh, are now working on um, all sorts of things, you know, uh, um, we spun out a 3D nanoprinting company, actually. Uh, we had a paper in science in 2018 on, uh, you know, the expansion method. We run it in reverse. Take a baby diaper polymer and laser print things in it and shrink it down. Dirt cheap way of making nanotechnology. So uh, I'm very excited that the, the way we think about problems, <coughs> excuse me, ground truth oriented, technology oriented, you know, um, thinking backwards from problems, you know, welcoming creativity and luck. That's being applied to different fields now. So if those classes that you teach and the students, do you actually many come into your lab afterwards and actually start to do a PhD in your lab? Um, not that often. It's happened a couple of times. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually one of the students who uh, co-spearheaded the expansion microscopy project took my class and then ended up joining my group later. And I, I, I will coming to, to the end of my questions, I think, in a minute. But... Where were you heading that you can tell us about? Where, where do you see, actually, what is the biggest problem that is yet to be solved and you still haven't found a solution for? Maybe that's a good answer, a uh, question. Well, the biggest problem that I think is a big struggle is, uh, is consciousness, you know, subjective experience, the feeling of feeling. 
Um, and I think the big one problem is that we can't measure it, right? Um, I mean, it's not even clear whether I'm a conscious being, right? You know, maybe I'm just a very accurate robot and the real Ed is over on a beach, you know, somewhere just lying in the sun, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, what we can't measure, it's really hard to study, right? And so, uh, yeah, so that's something I've been wondering about is can we build a way to measure consciousness in some way? Okay, and I I'm gonna ask this on behalf of any young scientist who's listening, how on earth do you get a place to work in your lab? Because I, I know if I was young, I'd be wanting to be in there. Yeah, well, we take graduate students from many different departments at MIT, um, brain and cognitive science, biological engineering, electrical engineering, and computer science, and so forth. Um, students at different Harvard departments can also work in our, our group as well, because MIT and Harvard have a, a, a several joint programs and whatnot. Um, for postdoctoral scholars, you know, uh, usually we interact uh, to see if there's some mutual path that looks interesting. And as noted, though, um, like almost half the group probably at this point is co-advised. So we also have a lot of people we work closely with. Um, you know, Li Wei Sai, who I mentioned earlier, where she's spearheading this attack on Alzheimer's disease. We have several joint students and now just a joint postdoc join who are building tools with me and then we're applying them to Alzheimer's with, with her. And one final question. You've been at MIT pretty much all your career. If you could move your lab, I don't, so assuming you could move the lab and all the support, because you've got an incredible environment that you've, that's enabled you to flourish so, so successfully. Do you regret not moving somewhere else and, and sampling a different environment? And would you like to do that at any point? Oh, I, I don't see how that could be possible. So again, our group is not just alone, right? Almost half the group have co-advisors all over MIT and Harvard right. and all over the place. So if we move, we have to move like the entire city of Boston. So I, 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 Boston is really a great place, right? Because you don't just have your university. You have Harvard and Tufts and BU and Brandeis and Wellesley and Mass General Hospital and Brigham and Women's and Beth Israel. And it's like being in this gigantic university that's the size of a city. And if you want an expert on any topic of any kind, you can find them. And our group is so like, a, like spider webs or the rays of the sun or connected with so many other things. So I really feel like we're like a, a hub and we're surrounded by spokes. Um, but um, you know, it's uh, it's it's almost like an ecosystem at this point, not but a group. Surely, but that's surely not just Boston. Surely got those spokes going out to nodes internationally as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. We have collaborators all over the world that we work very closely with. Um, yeah, probably the number of groups that we work closely with uh, is over a hundred groups at this point. Um, several of our papers uh, will have like eight groups working together. You know, a Swiss group that studies the retina and. Uh, um, uh, a Georgia Tech group that makes robots, and you know, then we, and then all these people come together uh, for a study. Okay, and I don't think I've ever met anyone that has so much going on with so much diversity and just has a grasp of it. I think that's utterly incredible. You are an incredible person. Oh, thank uh, you. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, I hope I haven't taken away your, your slots with uh, some of your students. Uh, for those who have watched or listened to my crosspiece, don't forget to subscribe uh, and watch some of the previous back episodes. But Ed, just inspirational. Thank you well, thank so much. You. Thank you. Really appreciate it. So great talking to you today. And yeah, stay in touch. And if anybody listening wants to work on something together, you know, again, I'm a big believer in luck. And one way to optimize luck is to connect people who have never talked across fields, across disciplines, across all these, you know, these boundaries to, to bring people together. Ed, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.